what we're going to look at today, and we're just waiting for Sean to join us, um, uh, is uh, an overview of the grant um, and then to hear from Tess about the Pacific and White Matters to Australian audiences um, and from two of our grantees, one past and one present, um, to look at preparing your application and implementing the grant. Um, I will also go through the application form to show you what that looks like and how to manage the budget. So um, as we know, uh, Tess, we might start with you, I think, um, just to, I suppose, give us a little bit of context for um, this grant and perhaps also um, help us to understand, um, uh, you know, Sean's uh, condition and why it is that he's um, expressing, I suppose, his love and passion for the Pacific through this program. So for those of you who aren't aware, Sean Dorney um, is an icon of journalism in the Pacific uh, for it, within the Australian media. He's a multiple Walkley award-winning uh, reporter, spent the best part of 40 years working with the ABC, uh, several stints in Papua New Guinea, um, a, a country with which he has a very deep connection, including via marriage and family. Um, a country that he knows an awful lot about that he understands very deeply. But he's also been uh, the ABC's Pacific correspondent um, and so has spent many years travelling to all parts of the all parts of the um, of the Pacific, covering some of the really important stories um, at national level, at regional level. Um, you know, he's been there for natural disasters, elections, Pacific Island Forum meetings and, and anything and everything in between. So Sean's love of Pacific journalism is blended with um, a degree of frustration at the lack of Pacific stories that get into the mainstream media. And his frustration, he, he gets frustrated when he hears from colleagues that they want to go to the region, they want to be out there in the region covering stories, hearing from Pacific people, getting those voices in front of audiences in Australia, but they're unable to do so. They're unable to persuade their editors to commission stories or release funds or, you know, they, 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 there's this ongoing struggle to get the stories across the line. And so in um, 2018, I think, uh, we decided that um, we we would have a go at trying to improve this by putting together a fund, some money that would be available on a competitive basis for an Australian journalist or Australian journalists to travel to the region to report on something that might not otherwise get reported on and bring back really high quality stories for Australian audiences. And this, this uh, grant uh, carries Sean's name as a way of him continuing to support the industry that he loves and to support an area of reporting that he's really passionate about. Some of you may know that Sean is currently living with motor neuron disease. So that limits his ability to be out and about um, in the Pacific, but it certainly doesn't limit his uh, passion for the region and for good reporting from the region. So he acts as uh, one of the judges for this grant and that's part of how he um, that's part of how he continues to support this area of work that he cares so much about. And I know from chatting with him that this time of year is his favorite time of year because when he gets the applications, he just loves reading through them, seeing what ideas people have, thinking about things that he might not have thought of before. And then being part of the judging process, it's something that he really values. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tess. So um, what we might do, I think, is perhaps we wanted to set the stage in this session with some of the big issues that are coming up in the Pacific region in 2024 and 2025. Um, obviously, the foundation can't say, here are all the story ideas that you should apply for. Um, but what are some of the perhaps geopolitical, uh, socio-cultural issues that uh, perhaps are coming up, elections that are coming up, the sorts of things that perhaps participants on the webinar um, might want to have a look at as they begin to ideate um, potential pitches? So, look, I think I think there's, there's a, there are a number of ways to, to look at 
where to find the stories from or where to get ideas from story for stories. And I think that for this area of journalism, it does require a certain amount of um, nuanced thinking and blended thinking. So on the one hand, you all work for outlets who are focused on Australian audiences and your editors want stories that will appeal to Australian audiences. So that need, that is a box that needs to be ticked. We can't sort of take that box away. However, given that what we're focused on is quality journalism, um, I think that there is uh, an imperative and certainly an opportunity to take the conversation further. And this grant allows for that. So as well, you know, to a certain extent, as we know, the media plays an educative role as well. One of the roles of good quality public interest journalism is to educate. So as well as thinking about what do what do your audiences want, there may be a need, or I, I believe that there's a need to think about what do your audiences need. And one of the things that they need when it comes to the Pacific is a deeper, broader, wider understanding of what is going on whether that is uh, in relation to climate change, whether it's in relation to geopolitical tension, whether it's in relation to labour mobility, whether it's in relation to gender issues. There's a need for Australian audiences to have an improved understanding of the, the complexity of these conversations. None of these conversations are straightforward. So this idea that, well, every, the most important thing in the Pacific is climate change. That's, to, you know, we, we need something that goes beyond that. What does that actually mean? You know, what, what does that actually tell us? Hmm. Um, I think, Joe, uh, Tess, I think also perhaps it's it's useful for journalists who may not have had the opportunity to travel to the Pacific um, is to, you know, any country seen from, ex from an external perspective may seem to be able to be summarised by a small handful of issues. But, of course, you know, those of us who've had the opportunity, um, and perhaps Joey and Marion, we might bring you in at this point. Um, you know, those of us who've had the opportunity to travel in the region, these are standalone countries, they've got schools, they've got hospitals, they've got their own politics and so on. So perhaps, um, you know, uh, Joe, you've spent a lot of time traveling in the Pacific. And so when you're starting to think about preparing um, story ideas, um, not just for this program, but of course for um, the other outlets that you've continued to freelance for. What sorts of things are you thinking about perhaps to stop thinking about the region as, as with an external lens and to think the kinds of stories that you might look for on the ground? When you say I've done a lot of work in the Pacific, I guess what I, I should point out is that nearly all the work I've done over the last 15 years or so has been in Papua New Guinea. Um, so obviously that's a, a substantial part of the Pacific, but it's not all of it. I've just done my first project um, trip to the Solomons, which was um, fascinating and interesting. But obviously, I, and the reason that I be, became a recidivist sort of parachute journalist in Papua New Guinea um, was very much out of a, an, a, a growing concern and questioning and reflective journalism, I guess, around what is the appropriateness and the limitations upon me as a story, outside a storyteller, you know, who am I to tell these stories? How do I tell them better if I presume that I do have a usefulness as an outsider telling these stories? Um, and really, over the course of the 15 or 16 trips that I'm reporting on trips I've made to PNG, it's been this sort of continuing process of growth and reflection to build on not layers of knowledge and to kind of answer those um, ethical questions that keep nagging at me about why, what is it that I think I can bring to the story legitimately and how can I tell the story as an outsider more use, usefully and truthfully. Um, so there was a conscious decision. I have problems with the concept of parachute journalism um, as an exercise um, and there are lots of limitations around it and I've done it a few times in places and thought I don't really want to do that again. Um, I did a project in Nigeria a few years ago and that made me really reflect on, on how 
I guess the the uh, the, the sort of sheer cheek, I guess, and schutzpah of somebody flying into someone else's reality for a couple of weeks and pulling out again. Um, so I in I figured that that working within Papua New Guinea and going back in again and again and really trying to focus on a core group of issues that were important but largely neglected in mainstream media. So they related to human rights, to women, to the impacts of um, extractive industry, um, socially and environmentally, uh, health, public health, disease, children's uh, nutrition, um, uh, climate change, climate justice, climate impacts. Um, out of that, you'll see there are a couple of holes there. I didn't go looking for the kind of political stories necessarily. I didn't go looking for the big corruption stories, even though it often came up against it. I guess I sort of looked at where are my skill sets and where do I see a need for some stories and opportunity that are not, you know, those sorts of stories were often neglected. So really when I come to crafting a pitch for a story, it's about thinking about how is it that I can bring something to this um, that's useful and true? How might I, um, how does it grow grow on the bedrock of layers of experience um, and make the most of those, those things? Joe, we might actually show a couple of the examples that you've shared with us um, because you've, I think the, the grant for you really has been an, ex, um, you know, it's been a part of a range of perhaps sources of funding, which is something that we'll talk a little bit about. But here are some of the stories that you've published um, either directly through or with some support from the grant since 2022. Um, I just want to uh, mention to folks on the call um, and who'll be watching this later um, that the links to each of these stories are available um, in the slide deck, and we're very happy also to share a copy of the PDFs for things that are behind a paywall. So perhaps, do you want to speak to um, perhaps one or two of these on the screen of the work that you did for The Guardian, Jo? Sure. Um, and I, one thing I'd point out, I, so I my pitch was in 2019, all those years ago. Um, before COVID, of course. Before COVID. And, <laughs> yep. and so the body of work that I produced it and is still coming through the pipeline, believe it or not, um, really changed quite substantially between my pitch in 2019 and what was delivered. Uh, part of that was the sort of two-year gap in, you know, normal programming for the whole world during COVID. Um, so my original pitch had been about really about a climate change and women and also women's, uh, the impacts, disproportionate impacts of climate on women um, in the Pacific, but also very much looking at questions I was hearing and concerns I was hearing from a lot of the social scientists and anthropologists that I engaged with over the years about this quite sort of simplistic and highly problematic, inaccurate and offensive framing of climate change in which the people of Pacific are, you know, the, the drowning islands victims um, and their fate is uh, inevitable. Um, and we'll, we, in the outside, we'll know that climate's really serious when they're they're underwater, you know, and and that narrative, and a lot of journalists would go into places and tell these sort of drowning islands narratives in which local actors are kind of given these bit parts. <laughs> um, and the context of local leadership um, and, and local priority uh, and initiative and capacity is kind of all largely neglected. So my original pitch was around climate impacts of women, but also trying to make sure that it was their priorities, advocacy, knowledge was centred in the reporting that I was going to do. Um, but so moving on a couple of years and then by the time I I was able to catch planes and develop the project, and so that means re-pitching, obviously, because I had originally had these pitches uh, pre-COVID and then adjusting to fit. Um, I still ended up doing a substantial amount of reporting that related to women and women's leadership, but because it happened that I was then going to be getting on the road during a national election in Papua New Guinea, which only happens every four years, I seized that opportunity. So I tried to, I made basically two trips to PNG in 2022. That The first one was during the election. 
So I was sucking up some of the material for the stories you saw in the last slide for The Guardian around women standing for parliament and the obstacles to that and the kind of background and and the efforts being made and why it matters and, and that includes within a climate context. But while I was there doing during the election, I was also doing some of the reporting about climate justice, um, which went more directly to the key concerns of my original pitch. So I sort of did a first sweep, a bit of a reconnoiter to try and locate the projects that I would come back to. And then I went made another trip in September uh, where I just really focused on the climate, um, these three climate locations that I had done the sort of, um, you know, the preemptive um, groundwork for earlier. Wonderful. Uh, I might just move on to the next couple of pieces here because, <clears throat> excuse me, there's the essay that you published in Minjin in 2022, but then there have also been pieces that you've been publishing since then, um, including an essay that was published uh, last year, which I understand has been shortlisted for an award. Um, and if you could just speak to those, and then we've been joined by dear Sean. So once you've spoken to those two pieces, we might just then um, introduce Sean and have a couple of words before we start to look at preparing for this year's um, pitches with Marion um, and myself, um, and then taking questions at the end. So do you want to just speak to these these sort of more recent pieces, Joe? Yeah. And I guess these are probably the two, the longest and most substantial. The ones I did for The Guardian were, you know, much more, you know, I think 800 words, 1,500 words might, is usually the max for them and much quicker turnarounds and very much linked to news events. Um, the climate, the month, this monthly piece we're looking at now, that was like, I think, a 7,000 word commission. Um, and I think I ended up writing 7,000 words for Mianjin as well. So they're both very much more, you know, considered long haul uh, kind of interdisciplinary sort of think pieces in a sense. So they're very deeply reported by the opportunity that the Dorney money allowed to get boots on the ground, spend time and get into locations that are just not viable usually for reporters to enter. Um, the photograph in the picture of here that I took, so this is a community that's right down on the Gulf. It's a village called Verai Barra, Verai Barry. Um, and it's moving, preparing to move. You can see the coconut trees that are all wiped out along what used to be the shoreline. This village is preparing to move for the fourth or fifth time in the last 50 years. And when they, I say move inland, they're, you know, they're moving about that much higher. There's not a lot of place for, for them to go. But to get to this community is very expensive. There's one or two flights a week. There are not really a commercial flight. So the, I think it was... A, a good 1500 Australian dollars I think for the ticket um, just to get near it and then I had to pay fuel and skippers to get down the down the river um, down into the delta uh, so logistically it's a week of time you don't know when you're going to get in and out the flights are not reliable the condition the weather's appalling um, the conditions are very difficult not many newsrooms are going to pay you to do that. And that was just one of three sort of similarly remote locations. Um, but it was really, so that that monthly piece probably is the most, um, the most reflective of my original piece. And I sort of see it as the heart of that, of the, the Dorney body of work. Um, and spinning out of that, I've had a, a, a radio piece on radio uh, from one of those stories that's highlighted in the monthly, one of the villages, and there's another one about to run about that Kakuri um, town. So it's really very much about how many ways can I cut this sausage, you know, and I'm trying to think all the time about the, in every story there's so many stories. So are there ways that I can cut it where I'm not shortchanging an editor of the story. I'm not trying to sell the same story twice. I'm trying to tease out different angles and threads um, that are standalone pieces, but are all capitalising one way or another on the rare experience of getting into these locations and spending good quality time talking to people and not hit and run. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jo. Um, I want, this is such a wonderful moment, really, perhaps to just bookend how you thought about preparing all of that wonderful coverage. And of course, Jo, you're a very experienced freelancer. And so you're used to managing multiple sources of income. I do want to reassure people, perhaps, who are used to 
um, you know, might be thinking about the grant just as a standalone piece of income to cover a piece of work, um, that there are different, as you say, different ways of cutting the cutting the sausage up. Um, so this is such a wonderful moment to welcome dear Sean Dorney. Um, Sean, uh, obviously, I remember working with you at ABC Radio Australia all those wonderful years ago. Um, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about why this grant is important to, to you and important for journalists to apply for. Yes, can I just uh, start by apologising for uh, my very late arrival? Um, as you may know, I've got motor neurone disease, which um, really makes me uh, uh, everything a struggle. And so I had to get my daughter down to um, sort out the uh, the computer so we could um, link up. But um, oh, sorry. That's okay. I think we all could use a more comfortable chair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is a power chair, and it's about as comfortable as I as I get. Um, yeah. Look, I, 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 I'm truly and deeply honoured that the Walkley's Foundation has, um, you know, continued to support this uh, this Sean Dorney Pacific Media Award. I, it's um, a huge honour. And um, I, I, I just think coverage of the Pacific is so important, and I'm really, really delighted that um, this award, this uh, grant, is going. And I'm truly impressed by Joe and and Marion and and the other the people who've already won this award and done such fantastic work. So, um, look, my passion is coverage of the Pacific and I did it for a long long time and um, you know I just am so delighted that this is going on. Thank you so much and of course one of this year's grantees is Marianne Farr. Um, Marianne you're preparing to go to Vanuatu so if you have a moment to perhaps begin to ease us into this idea of how you begin to prepare a pitch and how uh, you begin to implement the grant on that on that journey to, of course, broaden the range of Pacific coverage to Australian audiences as as in, is envisioned by the grant. Yes, yeah, so I am getting very close to finally finally heading off on my project. So I'm heading off on Sunday, and it has been this really. It, it feels like this. Um, it's been a lifetime <laughs> leading up to this point. Um, <laughs> Not quite, but but it has been a long time and a lot of preparation, but don't feel overwhelmed or daunted by that. Um, I guess um, in terms of um, coming up with a pitch, an idea, I, I'm i pretty fortunate in that I already work in the Pacific space, so um, working for uh, um, the ABC's Asia Pacific Newsroom um, for the Pacific Beat Radio Program, um, I I guess I came across the idea that I'm um, going to be working on through past stories that I'd done and people that I'd talked to. Um, and I guess maybe just adding to kind of what Joe said about, um, um, you know, thinking when you're thinking about the topics and or the issues you might like to cover, also just using your kind of um, like journalistic intuition when you, um, so for me, what really sparked this was speaking with a woman who, well, for context, my um, my project is looking at women's experiences of abortion. And, um, yeah, what sparked that idea for me was speaking with a woman um, in the Pacific who told me about her, her experience and it was just really uh, powerful to hear what she had to say. And I thought, wow, I've never heard anyone in the Pacific talk about this issue, let alone their own experience of the issue. And, um, and yeah, I was just really grabbed by what she had to say. And so that was the, I guess, the launch pad for my idea. And then I went about sort of thinking, okay, well, what other, what other the kind of um, aspects of this issue of women's experiences of, of abortion might we want to cover? Um, then it came to the practical side of things. I don't know if you want me to go into that, um, Corin, but um, you, yeah, um, I think one of the grant um, 
um, or the application requirements is that you have um, like a letter of endorsement from a publisher. So I um, gave my manager a heads up that I wanted to apply for this grant. Um, and one thing I would say is just um, just make sure that your organisation or your publisher supports um, will support will support you using the grant because I have had um, sort of instances in the past where um, that yeah the organisation may not have allowed for external funding to um, yeah to to be used um, so just early on make sure that that's okay <laughs> um, with your managers but yeah um, once I got approval I wrote out my pitch application um, I spent a bit of time on that I did it in a word document and um, I thought about um, you know what's the broad issue I want to cover what um, uh, who are the people I want to talk to I think like having a few case studies in there um, or potential case studies can make your application quite strong um, and then I ran that application, my application um, uh, document by my manager um, to make sure that they, you know, um, were agreed with what I was putting forward and um, and then got the letter of approval that I needed or the letter of endorsement that I needed for, um, yeah, to go with that application. Joe, you come to this as a freelancer um, and Marion, you come to this as a staff journalist. So I suppose... Marion, you've touched on some of the some of the um, I suppose tick boxes, if we like, that one would need to think about if you're a staff reporter. So just have that in your head for a second. Joe, you're thinking about this as not just one job with one line of income, but it might also involve other other pitches to other outlets so that all the work that you want to do in country um, might get up somewhere. Could you, for those those on the call who are freelancers but might be thinking about this as it's just one line of income and I'm just going to do one story, how do you approach that? Because you, you do it at a very advanced level. Yeah. Um, and, look, this the model I've kind of developed and refined and reworked over the years, it actually began when I was a staffer still at the age in the Sydney Morning Herald um, and thinking back. So this was 2000. 2008, 9, 10, um, and I was a senior writer with a strong interest in starting. In, I could see that Papua New Guinea um, was highly neglected in our storytelling and very important, and uh, and in those days it was very hard to get it on the radar on anything other than the share price of mining projects. Um, and um, so in order to try and do some stories in that area, I had to come up with what I call sort of the expedition model, where even as a staffer, I would say to the news desk, uh, I want to do a story about HIV rates in Papua New Guinea. And then I would say to Good Weekend, I've got a story about, um, um, I'm trying to think of some, you know, um, uh, well, Captain Carol Kiddo and trying and, and the restrictions on women getting into parliament and, and efforts to try and change that and a profile of her. And then I'd say to the business section, this thing called the PNG LNG is just starting up. They're all saying it's going to be the biggest thing ever for Papua New Guinea. I want to go and have a look at what the social impacts of that are starting to look like. So that model of trying to find three different pockets of money, even within one organisation, in order to get on a plane and spend a couple of weeks reporting and then reporting those three or four different pieces simultaneously. So it's sort of this hunting gathering exercise <laughs> where I go in with these four or five different stories on a wish list and I basically hit the ground day and night for those couple of weeks, vacuuming up raw material and then thinking later about how I'm going to process it and where it fits. But it's about how do I use the time in country to the biggest effect? And also in the Pacific context, that's a very healthy thing because you always need a plan B and C because plan A will inevitably not work. <laughs> And if somebody else says to me, welcome to the land of the unexpected, I might just floor them because, <laughs> you know, that's that's not great. But great stories do come out of these things. But I've had many moments where I'm standing on a, um, you know, on a tarmac in the middle of the Southern Highlands and the plane that I've arranged is just not coming because of one reason or the other. And I think, okay, plan B, <laughs> what are we going to do from here? How do I rescue the situation and still get a story? 
Um, so it's about always having having several several threads going and bouncing those kind of different projects around, um, being incredibly resourceful and broad-minded about how how you manage it. And 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 I guess always doing that thing at the end of the day of, of um an evaluation of your project. How is it looking and make a really if you have to make the assessment, I'm going to have to let that go because I can't afford to spend more of my precious itinerary time on a dead donkey than you're moving on, you know, quickly. So I think have being prepared for all contingencies and having a variety of stories on the go at any t- one time and adapting. Um, but that also means that you're, the people you're working for um they need to understand something of that context, which is a bit difficult because a lot of editors have never been there. They don't understand why you can't produce a receipt for the $900 worth of fuel that you just bought on the Fly River or something like that or why they couldn't contact you. So there's a little bit of an educative process so that they are, that they do they can support you when you need that and that they understand things are, things are dynamic. They're going to change and the story will be richer for that. Um but it, it, it does become that expedition model is I've taken that into freelancing and it means that I never get on a plane for one story. I always go for three or four stories. Um, but that also means being very clear with each publisher and every person that's funding you about what your obligations are to them, that you're not cross-contaminating but cross-pollinating <laughs> in a sense. So I don't want any editor or someone giving money to feel shortchanged Um um and that and and so you you have to remember where that you know who is feeding you to get this story and what did you promise them and just you know being entirely upfront in that process i mean tess and i had countless conversations because of the long process of mine and because it kept changing i kept coming back to check in with her and going look i actually think this is now that the timing is this what if i do this um, yeah. i think one of the things that i want to just come back to um, Marion, before we come to you, if I may, and thank you so much for your patience, um, is the point you raised earlier, Joe, about parachute journalism. And one of the other elements of this grant program um, is a, a highly desirable, um, and the judges will be looking for it, commitment to work with and provide some of the grant payment to a local contributor. So maybe, Tess, could you speak to that for a moment? And then, Marion, I'd love to ask how you're planning to work with local contributors in Vanuatu. Yeah, thanks, Corinne. So obviously, um, you know, I think Jo's Jo's points, and she's just touched on what I know is a much deeper reflection on this issue of parachute journalism. And we know that there is a very active and diverse uh, media landscape in the region. And these are the journalists who really do know the local context, the local actors, what the challenges are, who's doing what, who's related to whom, where the bodies are buried, all of those things across any any issue. They also, they have issues as suit, with resources as well. So for a lot of them, if they're based in a major centre, if they're based in Port Vila, their opportunities to get to Santo or Malakula or anywhere outside of Port Vila are really limited uh, by things, the exact same things that you guys are limited by, budget and support. So one of the things that the judges look for very, you know, and are, are very supportive of and, are, you know, keen to see is how these resources can be shared with local counterparts. So obviously this, you know, the, and this is the intention is that this goes beyond simply employing a fixer. That this is about identifying a local journalist or a local news outlet. They might be, you know, they might be an online outlet or they might be a well established print outlet that could be, you know, whatever. How can you work with them to, so, to, so that they can be part of the story so that they can benefit from the extra resources that you bring, you, you know, which is primarily cash, um, but you also bring some additional thinking. You may be able to offer them an opportunity to have a byline or a credit in an Australian outlet that, that might they might not have been able to achieve so far. 
Um, so that's that's definitely something to think about. And on that, just to kind of, and I'm happy to come back to this later, but one of the things that I would encourage people who are new to Pacific journalism is to build up your awareness of Pacific media. So, you know, the Vanuatu Daily Post is online, the Post Courier is online out of PNG, there are Fiji outlets online, Radio New Zealand, Pacific has a lot of Pacific news. So, you know, you can, it's easy to, well, it's not easy, but with a bit of work, you can populate your feeds with news and reporting that's coming out of the Pacific Islands business is a really good publication to follow and subscribe to. So that a, you're, not only are you getting a sense of what is in the news in these countries, but you're also building a sense of who the journalists are that you might want to link up with, which are the outlets that you think you might be able to work with when you go into country. They can help you with everything from you know, the logistics, but more importantly, and Sean, you and I have talked about this before, you know, there's just the the depth of knowledge and context that they bring, um, you know, in terms of, like I say, who to talk to, and you'll find particularly in the small countries, you know, they'll say, oh, yes, well, you know, that minister is my uncle, or I go to church with those people, and they can, I can set me. And so, it's it's about, you know, I think one of the things that we would love to see come out of this grant is to be able to point to some really beneficial partnerships that have um, developed. I think, you know, the, the, there, is, there is a perception of the Australian media in the region, not as a result of the work of people like Joe and Marion, but as, the, you know, thanks to other people, that Australian journalists just arrived extract information, piss everybody off by being our souls and then disappear. Um, and this is an opportunity for Australian journalists, good quality Australian journalists, to change that perception and behave in ways that that will help, that will make Pacific people proud of the fact that you came to their country and talked to them and asked them questions and told their story in a way that they can point to and be proud of. Joe, I know you're on deadline with many things, so we might let you bow out. And thank you so much for joining us today. Marion, thank you so much for your patience. Um, there's two questions I wanted to ask you. So I think the, the first one is about how you're planning to work with journalists in country. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to talk about that. Um, and, yeah, just building on what Tess said, it's not even um, that, that uh, local um, journalists or um, producers um can offer ideas of who to talk to, but even just how to talk to them. And an example that I've um, come across just in the last week is um, um, advice from a local um, a local television producer who's been helping me um, arrange an interview with um, a traditional medicine man or a traditional what they call custom doctor or clever in in Vanuatu. Um, which has been quite hard um, because um, he doesn't have a phone and, um, you know, lives a bit remotely. Um, anyway, so I'm sort of talking about, oh, okay, when can we meet up with him? When can we do this interview? And um, the advice he gave me is, oh, we should meet him for Carver first because um, and have this initial meeting over Carver and get to know one another because that's sort of the culturally appropriate thing to do. And, there, and that way you build a relationship that will, enhance your storytelling and so that's the sort of value um yeah and, and and it's it's just great to increase your like cultural awareness and sensitivity so I really think that that's um um yeah a really really important thing to do um one thing I would say is um just thinking logistically about um who you might want to partner with and work with and make sure that they're actually able to do that because I um um yeah I guess I've come across instances where um I'd been put in touch with someone um they were really keen to work with me but they already like they were employed by another media organization and that media organization said no we're not going to release this person yeah. um to work with you so yeah. um and, I think and some, some of that is actually just thinking about it from the perspective of try. I mean part of to me part of the purpose, I suppose, of a grant opportunity like this is to actually see 
a different place through the as best one can through a local lens. Um, and that includes thinking about, you know, if you, for example, you work at the ABC, if someone was to ask you to assist them on a freelance basis with a story, they would have to think about how they would do that um, and may or may not get permission. Um, but that being said, you know, there are wonderful resources, uh, you know, tests, obviously, um, we at the foundation can also perhaps assist with, are there any freelancers that we, we would be able to find? There are some wonderful um, social, uh, social uh, I want to say platforms, but it's groups really. There are some wonderful Facebook groups that um, a lot of uh, Pacific freelancers belong to. So it's not like one is starting from scratch. Um, let's come to the, the point about um, mentoring. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that's offered to uh, grantees is access to a mentor. Um, our mentors are all uh, journalists who've spent a considerable amount of time in the Pacific or covering the Pacific or both. Um, and uh, Marion, you've been working with Drew Ambrose, of course, from Al Jazeera. So um, you will be paired up with a mentor who's from outside your news organisation, which is also important because you can have very productive confidential conversations to just mm -hmm. soundboard a story without thinking about the, I suppose, internal um, elements of that. So how's that worked out for you and, and what sorts of um, help have you had? And then, very friends, we will then jump straight onto the application form so that we finish it all within just under, just over an hour. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Yeah, really, really happy to talk about this point because um, the mentoring has been so invaluable and I guess it's kind of when I – first applied for the grant I wasn't at all thinking about mentoring and I didn't even really know that that was offered as part of um, the grant um, and it has been yeah one of the most um, one of the highlights of the grant for me um, yeah so your mentor I guess can help you you know with all sorts of things whether it be like you know the particular project that you're working on and um, Drew has helped me so much you know just going through um, you know our shooting scripts and talking about technical things and who you might like to talk to and what kind of questions you might ask in an interview and yeah all the all these things so and you really think about what kind of skills you might want to build um, through through the grant and through the stories that you're working on um, and um, and have a think of I, I guess um, yeah who who might be a good fit for your project and for what you're um, what you're hoping to achieve. Um, so yeah, um, I think yeah your mentor is such an invaluable resource. Um, it's really it's yeah it's been a really great experience. Um, and just having someone to bounce ideas off, to call in a moment of crisis, as I did with Drew a couple of weeks ago when I had to suddenly push my project back because I'd fractured both, both my wrists, um, which, had, yeah, um, threw a bit of a spanner in the works. But Drew was there and, you know, helped me kind of come up with contingency plans and um, that sort of thing. So, yeah, um, definitely make the most of that experience if you're successful. Yeah, and I think just something before we start looking at the application form and process is that, you know, the, the foundation is here to help. Um, you know, our advisor, dear Tess, is here to help. Your mentor is here to help. Um, stories do change. I think um, we were all nodding our heads when um, Joe was saying that uh, stories can change out from under you purely by the nature of the fact that it's a um, developing and emerging economy region. Um, things that perhaps, you know, if you're used to the, sh the, the train showing up at 8.28 a.m. Um, in Sydney or Brisbane or Adelaide, um, it may not work out quite the same way um, in those contexts. Um, and so, you know, things might need to be reframed or discussed and changed. And so we just keep in touch on everything and, and we're here to help and be at your service. I was just going to say, Sean and I have um, agreed that no good story starts with and then the plane arrived on time. So. <laughs> so true. Well, Tessa, I, I, um, Sean, maybe I'm, I'll start with you. I just wanted to to thank you and you don't need to sit around and look at an award force form and a budget. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Is, uh, would you like to perhaps um, share some closing thoughts before we move on to that part of it? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, once again, apologies for uh, my late arrival on the scene. Um, look, there, there are just so many interesting places out there in the Pacific. Um, and the, the point made earlier about uh, collaborating with local colleagues, there are some terrific journalists right throughout the region. 
Um, and I have got, you know, some very, very strong and lasting friendships with um, my colleagues from the Pacific. So um, if you are fortunate enough to, to win this grant and you get out there, get to know the local journalists because they can be, as has been said, have been tremendous support and help for you. And uh, their knowledge is a fund to to be plundered. <laughs> but um, look, I, I, I just, um, I had a whole heap of things prepared to say before I came on here, but having come late, I, <laughs> I haven't um, said a lot of those. But look, I, I just think there's just enormous scope for stories that should be of interest to Australians throughout the region. Uh, there, Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia, there are lots of different countries there, which lots of different stories and um, very, very impressive people. So um, my advice is get out there and do it. That's such a wonderful summary of probably everything that you were preparing to say today. It is it's so true. Um, and I suppose if I if I might just build on that momentarily, um, I spent five years working for Radio Australia. I think one of the things that I learned through that um, was by digging into the regional media, um, one gets a, that really nuanced understanding um, of particular issues that maybe from an external um, outsider to the region can seem a little bit um, unnuanced, for want of a better word, that to really get to grips with the details, you can start to have a look at um, the, you know, the Fiji Times, uh, the Samoa Observer, um, you know, uh, the radio stations in the region, obvious, obviously there are many. Radio New Zealand has a wonderful website. And then, of course, our own wonderful ABC has a very broad and growing um, section uh, sections um, across radio, television, um, and online. Um, Marion, maybe you could mention a couple of, of spaces that people could begin to um, go and look for stories if they're going to be our 2025 grantees. Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, so within ABC, we've got Pacific Beat, which is a radio current affairs show that I work for, um, which um, runs every every morning and afternoon. The morning show is the longest one, um, uh, probably the most in-depth um weekdays so that's on abc radio australia we've also got um a whole host of new kind of radio programs like um that are pacific focused on radio australia um so from sports shows to music shows to kind of just um like arts and culture so have a listen to abc radio australia also um um i'm not sure how this i don't i don't know when the deadline is for um for applications the 15th of april the 15th of april okay well at the beginning of april um the pacific is a tv program um that runs on abc and and abc australia so it's broadcast in the pacific um it's beginning starting up in april again for its third season i think um so have a watch of that um and there's like an abc slash like abc news slash pacific um and you can just get a bunch of pacific news there um but yeah just um like if you just google whatever country you're interested in vanuatu news you'll find you know the vanuatu daily post and bbtc so yeah have a have a look at what's being reported in the region because that's really valuable too Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to now do um, the administrative part of this session, which is to explain how to fill in the application form um, and also just a brief overview of the budget. Um, if you've not used a budget before in Excel, uh, by the end of this um, call, you'll know how to do it. Um, it's very simple. Um, and so I'll, I'll thank our dear guests, um, Tess newton Kane and Sean Dorney and Marion Farr. Obviously, you're welcome to stay on the call. Um, but we'll just now move over to the application process. So thank you all so very, very much for joining us as guests today. So when you um, log on to our platform, it looks like this when you land on it. And I'll put a link uh, to all of these into the slide deck. So it's very straightforward <laughs> to find. And there, of course, you are at the very top, dear Sean. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love that photograph. Um, so there's a button here which says apply now. 
But before you click on that button, please scroll down to the judging criteria and terms and conditions. What this will do is help you understand what's expected. Uh, so what the judges will be looking for, uh, the essentials and the desirables. And you'll see here highly desirable as plans that um, the proposals that include a plan to work in collaboration with Pacific journalists or media organizations. And then below that are the terms and conditions. So please have a look at your, your eligibility, the conditions of the grant, um, what's expected of the publication that you pitch your grant, your, your story or stories to, um, and then what's expected of you. And as I mentioned earlier, um, my email address is everywhere. So if you get stuck or you have any questions, um, please drop me an email. So once you click on um, Apply Now, which is on the main landing page, um, it will take you to our application section. Now, um, I'm a manager in this program, so what I can see will look a little bit different to what you can see, um, but you can see here it says Start Application. So it's just over here on the right, and you just click on Start Application. And that's going to take you through um, a series of landing pages. So the first one is just start here. So it will um, so ideally give your application name, your name plus the story title. So let's say, for example, if I was going to do a story about, um, I don't know, tourism in Fiji and the, the economics of it, economics of Fiji tourism, just something simple so that <clears throat> we can find it quite easily in the list of applications. The next screen along is your personal information. And it's pretty straightforward, your first name, your last name, where you currently work or whether you're a freelancer, contact information, um, including a postal address, and just post the links here to your social media platforms that you would like us to be across. Um, I know we're not always on all of them, um, but for example, if you're mostly on threads or mostly on Twitter or mostly on LinkedIn, just pop them there and there's no, it's a, it's a text field, so you can very easily fill in all of that. Um, as you go through, remember to um, click at the bottom, and I'll just note on my slide deck um, that it always asks you to do save and next. Save and next is your friend when you're applying for anything through the Walkley Foundation's Award for site, because then you can leave it and come back to it later. Um, so say always save and next. Okay, so as we go through each session section, the next ses section along is your headshot and bio. So we ask you to write a 50 word bio suitable for publication and to put up a, a headshot of yourself, a photograph of your shot, yourself. Um, I do have an example of what to do and what not to do with this. So the picture on the left is a headshot. The picture on the right is not. Um, so just think about a professional shot that you might you know, put on your social media or your LinkedIn or so on. So it's a headshot. Um, the next section along is where the, the main body of the grant application takes place. So the first thing there is to write a maximum of 300 words summary of your story idea. The idea is the idea, the top line. So how would you sell it to an editor is how you would sell it to the judges and the angle you plan to take. So it's not just about, for example, climate change in Fiji. It would be a specific aspect or angle around climate change in Fiji. For example, um, the impact of um, shifts in climate on the tourism industry um, might be the angle. Um, and then, you know, what's the story idea? I'm going to be looking at the, this story from this particular angle. I plan to talk to these people about it. And this is the, the finished story. So that, so that the judges have a very clear idea of the story. The last bit of that 300 words should explain why this story and angle matter to Australian audiences. Um, and so that's the sort of, you know, the who cares element when we, when we think about why we're pitching a story is who's going to care about this here in Australia. Then... Jump back into the judging criteria. There's a live link to the same landing page on our website here in the application form and outline in 200 words just briefly how your story plan meets those judging criteria.
That should include how you plan to work with a local content producer or producers. Um, you may not have all of those relationships set up front. Um, so just to be really clear on that, um, a plan to work with local freelancers um, is wonderful. Um, you may not necessarily have identified the exact freelancer or, or media outlets that you want. Wonderful if you have, um, but just to um, include that plan in your in your story preparation is, is a good thing to do and even better if you've identified who you want to work with. Um, one of last year's winners had identified a local media partner in Solomon Islands um, and had a very clear plan um, about how that relationship was going to work and plans for joint bylines and so on. So that's sort of gold standard, but at least have thought about it. Then describe where you're going to publish your story, including the names of the outlet or outlets and the specific platforms or program names where you expect to publish it. So, for example, it might um, you might think about um, something within the, the nine slash Fairfax um, platforms but you know it might be in good weekend or it might be in spectrum or it might be in traveler um, so to be really quite clear about where you're planning to publish it um, if you can also include lists of um, social platforms that might also carry it great um, that particularly applies i think if you're coming to this grant from a publish uh, from a broadcaster background to think are there uh, you know facebook pages managed by your publisher that might be a good place to share this as well um, all of this um, assumes that you will have pitched this to a publisher and have a commitment from them to publish it. So as part of your application, you will need to upload that. Um, it agrees to publish the finished work and also to address the concern that was raised earlier in this webinar um, to display Walkley uh, Public Fund branding on the finished work. We will provide you with a branding toolkit and you can share that with your editor as you go along. Um, it's fairly straightforward. It includes a logo that would go on um, print or digital um, and on the landing page of any um, web hosting of, of video or audio content. Um, so just include that letter of commitment. Then 100 words. Why are you the best person to tell this story? So what is it about you that makes you a great choice for this grant? Um, and then this last Second last section here, the bottom section is uh, about the mentoring. So that's an opportunity for you to outline what you would need from a mentor. So it might be if your story is, for example, about a particular country, say, could you please help me find somebody with specific experience in Papua New Guinea or Vanuatu or Solomons or Fiji or Tonga, etc., cetera, um, and the kind of, of support that you might want. Now, before we leave this section, if you click this link, it will automatically download a copy of the budget template. And you can see that that's actually downloaded to my computer. So um, I'll talk to you about the, the budget template in a moment and just explain how to fill it in. Um, let's go back up to the top. So then there's a section here, which is examples of your work. These can be shared with us as URLs or live links. Um, as long as they are available to the judges without going behind a paywall. If they're behind a paywall, um, you can add the login for information here, but we would really prefer that you upload a story, a version of your story as a file. So if it's a text story, it can be a Word or a PDF document. If it's photographs, JPEGs or PNGs. If it's audio, um, MP3 or a WAV or a Windows Media, and if it's a video, MP4, the main formats are there. So that's the three ways, the two ways that you can share your story is as a live link or as a file upload, and we need three of those from you. So there's three sections there to, to do that. We're nearly through the application form. The next thing is declaration of entrant. So excuse that these are, these are grayed out. Um, that's because I'm a manager on this form. But just make sure that you've met the judging criteria and then tick the box. Make sure that your work samples meet the MEAA Journalist Code of Ethics requirements. There's a live link so you can double check them and then check, tick that box. Um, 
then there's a legal, um, sorry, a, sorry, a, an original work. Um, so I've you tick this box to make sure that we know, we are confident that it is your own original work. We then have some declaration sections. So we know that a lot of journalists nowadays are using um, AI tools um, that can include things like Otter, um, but it might also include ChatGPT. Um, so you need to list the tools that you've used um, to support the work. Um, you can't use these tools to create the work, obviously. Um, so just go through the AI declaration just to say here are the tools that I've used. And once you've done that, tick the AI declaration box. Um, and then if there are any corrections or legal challenges or any payment issues, generally speaking, the answers to those questions is no, but just have a read through and make sure that you've made any ne necessary declarations. And once you've done those, um, you just tick the box below them. If there are none, just write none in these text fields. Um, then there's two extra boxes that the responsibility is with you to make sure that the judges can read your work um, and that everything is true, true and correct, and then you can um, press submit. So that's the application form. It's it's um, not too onerous, um, but you know, make sure you start early. Don't leave it until the, the day before um, because there are some documents that you're going to need to upload. The last thing I want to show you is the budget. So as you can see here, it has two tabs. One has some sample numbers in there and one is blank. So if you've never used a budget before, um, I don't know, before I went into journalism training, I had never used a budget. Um, now I use them all the time and I love them. So the sample template <laughs> helps me understand, all right, if I was planning to go to Fiji, for example, I would estimate that my flight might be worst case scenario, $1,200. When I actually come to fill that in, actually I got it for $1,150.98. So you always do your estimates here. So for your application, you only need to fill in the estimate here. So you describe the kind of things you'd like to spend your money on, and then you put an estimated cost here. I encourage you to do a little bit of Google research to work out what the rough cost is likely to be. Um, it's a, uh, in Excel or if you're using this in Google, um, you just right click to insert extra rows. Now, the wonderful magic thing about this is that at the bottom, these have got what's called functions. So when I click on 980, it's got a sum here. So it's going to add up everything from B11, which is here, all the way down to the bottom. So B39, which is the last one, and it'll continue to do that. So let's say I decided that I was going to pay my local contributor instead of $3,000, I'm going to pay them $3,500. Suddenly I'm slightly overspent. So I will need to cut back something else because I only have $10,000 of grant money to spend. So hopefully that makes sense. And of course, as you go through and add your actuals, so you can see that the total sum there is $9,731. So I'm about $268 underspent. That would be what I would have at the end of the grant. And this is my estimate. So in tiny text there, it says your total estimate should be close to $10,000. Um, try and leave yourself a little bit of wriggle room. So your, your estimate might be 8,500 because you know that you probably have 1,500 or come up along the way. Um, at the start of the project, the balance, which is how much you haven't spent, will be 10,000. At the end of the project, it should be very close to zero. Now, the third column is important. If you're a staff journalist or if you're someone like Jo Chandler who had additional funds that she brought to the table, um, you can record this. It helps you track. Um, for example, if some funds came in from Guardian Australia, if you were pitching to them, you might then add a line here, insert row above, and just say Guardian Australia. I've spelled that wrong. Australia contribution, spelled that wrong as well. And so let's say that was around $2,000. 
and that will add up in a separate column. But your grant money is um, estimated here and actuals here. So friends, I'm going to stop the share um, as we are quarter to 12 and just see if there are any questions at all um, from anybody uh, that you want to ask in this session, but you can, of course, email me. So um, if you do want to ask anything, you can use the raise hand function at the bottom or you can pop it into the Q&A box. But I think we've probably gone through everything we possibly can. Well, friends, if there's no questions, um, I might actually ask Sean to close this session for us. Um, Sean, back to studio. Would you like to wrap up the session for us? Yes, thank, thanks very much, Corinne. That, that's, um, I haven't seen the uh, the budget explained so well before. So, um, look, I'd just urge you to really think hard about putting in for this grant because there are lots of stories out there and, um, you know, they need to be told and Australia needs to know what's going on in the region. So please put in an application. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody who's been on the session. And if you're watching this later on, um, thank you for your patience and we look forward to your applications this year. <laughs>